frustrated me in the biotech space, but also there's, there was this sort of general realization I had, um, which was same terrible code um, that everyone that like uh, I write was the same terrible code that everyone else writes. It is unfortunately the same terrible code that we're all relying on to uh, diagnose uh, the coronavirus now, um, uh, which is unfortunate. Also, you know, it was, it's been almost like se 10 years since I sort of got out of the biotech space and there's been almost no technological advancement, which has been incredibly frustrating. Uh, so anyways, just sort of, um, so I started teaching myself distributed systems, cryptography, um, I met Jay back in 2013, um, and, you know, he was when Tendermint was just an idea, um, and w what sort of, so I guess the, the, the biggest way to like bring all of these threads together is, um, before Ethereum was a thing, there was an older model of smart contracts that the Agoric people worked on in the 1990s. And this older model of smart contracts was basically the idea of, so if in the, uh, 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 so, you know, one model of smart contracts is, um, is sort of the mainframe time sharing model where everyone uh, 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 connects to essentially one single computer and executes their code and composes their code with everyone else's. And what the Agoric people um, uh, were sort of thinking about all the way back in the 1990s was a model of smart contracts in which you had mutually distrustful computers um, that, uh, you know, I could run uh, 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 my uh, uh, code on me and my friend's uh, uh, machine and uh, on like on, on a machine that was controlled by me, my, myself or my friends. Um, it could have uh, uh, things of value controlled by that code and uh, still compose with software that's running on our, um, our uh, you know, on, on, uh, on computers running by our trading partners, etc. And to a certain extent, these ideas have found some success through the careers of the Agoric folks in, um, in sort of enterprise settings, um, but there was never really an opportunity to bring this to the people. And what, and sort of this, there was so sort of interested in these ideas um, and sort of as I got into more and more cryptography, smart contracts, all this stuff, interested in this set of ideas of, oh, this seems like a, a potentially a more scalable, more extensible, more interesting approach to developing a crypto economy than the Ethereum model, which sort of uh, went straight for this giant mainframe in the sky uh, uh, model. And I wanted to see that come into reality. But in order to make this accessible to the people, there was a missing piece. And the missing piece was uh, uh, like Byzantine fault tolerant consensus. Um, because while if you are a very large institution, you can provide, you can give people confidence that your computers are running well uh, through, you know, uh, organizational uh, uh, processes and SOC audits and stuff like that. Um, that is, you know, that, that kind of structure is inaccessible. But if we made, the vision of Tendermint was if we made Byzantine fault tolerant state machine replication available to the masses, um, you know, a, a system that offers comparable assurances to like a large bank or, uh, or, a, um, or, you know, uh, you know, a fortune 500 company, we could actually make that available to everyone. And so, um, if you kind of take, go through like sort of my contributions in the blockchain space. Um, in 2018, 2018 was all about uh, uh, making Tendermint available to the masses and making uh, that part of the Cosmos vision. Uh, so it was about test nets. It was about 
teaching people to use the software. It was about getting the software out of the world. And so that sort of was the whole journey of the of Tendermint and Game of Stakes. Uh, and that was sort of what I really did in 2018, which was, um, you know, I've been a contributor to many projects in the blockchain space, but the reason I focused on Cosmos is because there was this real opportunity to take this very important piece of software that is literally the culmination of 40 years of computer science research and bring it to the masses. Um, and so that's what we did. Um, and that is, you know, and, you know, there, there are uh, uh, many people on this call who are running Tendermint and building their businesses on top of Tendermint. And, and that was what I wanted to make possible. Um, it, was, it was this distribution of Tendermint out into the world. So that was the whole, that was the whole, um, that was the success of Cosmos uh, uh, or like the sort of, and the journey of Cosmos in 2018 that sort of came together in the launch of the Cosmos Hub in 2019. Um, but, you know, we also saw pretty significant events like Binance Chain adopting Tendermint and the Cosmos stack. Um, the, uh, um, the launch of Iris. And now, you know, there are probably a few dozen different um, Cosmos uh, or Tendermint implementations out in the world. So, fantastic. But this is very limited. This is not the full vision of Cosmos. Um, the full vision of Cosmos is figuring out how the, uh, uh, how all of this can be the users of Tendermint. And, you know, we, I always believed that once we demonstrated that, um, that Tendermint was possible, that it was possible to build a system like this, um, there would be a Cambrian explosion of, of, of new implementations, new protocols, et cetera. And all, but all of this stuff, if they are simply islands by themselves and there is no composition possible, um, all of this is kind of empty and pointless. Um, or perhaps not pointless, but it is a pale uh, a, a reflection of what could be. And so that's why the last year has been really this, this uh, uh, focus on getting IBC out the door. So why don't I just like kind of like conclude by sort of walking through the milestones of sort of delivering IBC and like how, how we sort of see sort of, sort of the, the, the rollout of IBC. So um, starting on in, at the beginning of May, on May 1st, um, we're going to be doing something called Game of Zones. Um, and Game of Zones is sort of inspired by the work that we did with Game of Stakes, um, which was a, a test net that sort of uh, was the first incentivized test net and sort of drove and like created this whole like sort of world of, 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 um, of innovation around, uh, 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 you know, virtually every other blockchain now has done incentivized test nets. Um, but it is a little, it is quite a bit different. And, you know, Jack wrote a very nice blog post about how the IBC test net is not like other test nets and game of zones is not like other uh, um, is not like other uh, 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 test uh, is not like other incentivized test nets in the sense that it's this bring your own blockchain model and the real goal of game of zones is not really to test IBC the real goal of game of zones is to familiarize a population of people with all of the different uh, components of IBC the, the mechanism of operating a blockchain connected uh, to IBC, the, the experience of running a relayer and keeping a connection alive, and the, and the components around, um, and, the, and the sort of necessity of the, um, of, of, and like then like as users of IBC, like what are the security model, what is the security model, what are the risks, uh, those are the sort of core components of IBC. Um, after we complete Game of Zones, um, we have this, we, the, the reality of the situation is, is that um, there are many, there's like a whole universe of major upgrades to the Cosmos software that are all sort of landing at the same time. Um, uh, sort of state sync or fast sync or instant sync uh, of nodes is, is landing. Um, we're tearing out our custom, uh, 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 our custom serialization format 
amino and we're replacing it with the standard protobuf serialization format the um uh the we have this uh zero downtime upgrade module that's landing um all of these things so what we're doing is we're actually going to have to go through a process of sort of this very substantial upgrade to the cosmos hub that is going to um probably affect every single user of the cosmos hub and then the the sort of final piece of this uh uh, uh and then on after that we get to launch IBC on the Cosmos Hub and have no and have zones uh, connecting to it in a substantial way for the first time, um, and so that and you know the 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 we actually get to see um, what makes the you know what the Cosmos Hub must now find its purpose in this world of the Internet of Blockchains. Um, so that's sort of the journey that we've been on. Hopefully, this is like a, it was a helpful framework for everyone on this call. Um, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Maybe Jay. Yeah, thank you so much, Zaki, for that uh, beautiful keynote. And of course, um, some notorious elements always around there. Um, sorry for that. And to all the participants as well. Um, so we will quickly now jump into the panel discussion, what Zaki has mentioned and how everybody else, uh, like how different projects are implementing and what their insight is about IBC and way forward. Um, so just to introduce the panel, we have Zaki on the panel. We have Tushar from Persistence. Um, we have Sergey from Cyber Congress and we have Sorovit from Band Protocol. Um, so just to give you an idea, it's about um, why IBC is a game changer for the entire blockchain industry and not essentially only Cosmos. Um, so just to start off with, we'll have an open question for like anybody wants and all the speakers on the panel want to talk about what is like blockchain. Uh, blockchains have been operating in silo for a long time. How do you think IPC will bring value not only for Cosmos, but all of the protocols? I guess that's the most curious question everybody wants to know. Um, who wants to kick it off? Happy to get started. Did you unmute the panel? Guess, yes. Yeah, there we go. Now it's unmuted. <laughs> we were all on mute before, I think, apart from Zaki. <laughs> Okay, so sorry, with are you on mute? Yes. If you can, no. just... yeah. can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Anyone who wants to take that question first? Well, I think I don't, I'll, I'll go if 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 uh, while everybody is is waiting. I'm not sure. Um, this is obviously personal view, and um, uh, you can think about it whichever way you like. But the way I see it is. Um, I will have to make a small intro first in terms of how we personally look at IBC. And obviously Zaki gave a really cool comparison to TCP and how it all functions. And this is probably the correct way to put it technically. And um, I've used this comparison before, I think. And um, the way we view it is we compare it to HTTP and HTTPS. And the reason we do it is because we look at websites like web2 is full of websites and every website is pretty much it's a database well most websites have some kind of databases that make queries to servers uh, to make write responses or read responses whatever and until all of those websites were connected together they were just separate things and basically what ibc does because blockchains are obviously oh, their databases as well and the most important thing they have spot resistance 
which is a single point of failure resistance, which most websites obviously don't have because they have to trust some kind of um, server or domain or whatever. And um, basically this will bring all those databases to a state where they can communi communicate with each other. And most importantly, they can communicate in a provable and a trustless execution. So if we look at IBC from this perspective, where it's a technology that allows databases to communicate in a provable and a trustless execution, we can see that it's not about Cosmos, it's about any database that is able to connect um, and have a, and, and create a just endless possibility of markets in terms of like exchanging data not just token transfer, obviously, because token is just like just the most simple example of data, obviously. So this is one way that I see it. I mean, obviously, I'm sure that other people see it other ways. So I will probably let others speak as well. Zaki, do you want to go? I think you have to unmute everyone again, guys. Because it's just uh, me speaking now. I, I think we can uh, keep Hitesh. I think Hitesh is the one managing the uh, muting and unmuting. I think if we can keep all the panelists. So I, I guess once someone mutes themselves, then ah, okay, I have okay. to unmute again. So if you can just raise your hand, I'll unmute you. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'll just say that so what I think is probably the most exciting um, uh, piece of, of the sort of IBC mechanism is trying to figure out what the most interesting pieces of sort of compositionality um, uh, are out there. So I think one model that of compositionality that um, I think has been underappreciated is um, something like the, uh, the the sort of the DeFi peg zone concept that Altia um, has been sort of championing, which is on one hand, you have a validator set controlling a smart contract on Ethereum. On the other hand, you have the ability of that validator set to synthesize assets and those assets then to operate over IBC. And I think this is, this sort of represents um, kind of a pattern that we will see that I'm hoping that will be kind of universal or become widespread in Cosmos, um, which is this pattern of, cre of, of, of allowing um, sort of, um, uh, you know, we, we've seen this idea on Ethereum, which is, you know, the creation of things like CDI, which is like, you know, you have your die in compound, and, but you also have a synthetic asset CDI that is also trading. Um, and that's uh, uh, interesting. But this can be sort of elaborated in a much more comp like interesting way. For instance, you could have um, DAI in a DeFi peg zone and that DAI also, that synthetic DAI also be a fee token on the Cosmos hub. Um, this ability to sort of elaborate on and extend and extrapolate um, uh, the, the, the financial assets of the blockchain space into new use cases and new utility um, is sort of represents to me like the true vision of, of IBC where, you know, the abstractions of sort of one of, of sort of unitary layer one protocols have always have constrained us from really exploring this in the past and we are no longer constrained in this way. Yep. I think uh, to jump in, I think, uh, you know, Zaki mentioned the word, uh, you know, bring your own blockchain. And I think that's the view that Cosmos has held in terms of having um, application specific blockchains. And uh, one of the things that we have seen in the last, uh, you know, kind of month or so is also, you know, on the 12th of March, we saw kind of, um, you know, DeFi as a whole unravel on, on the quote unquote uh, Black Thursday. And so we saw uh, even kind of last night uh, or Saturday night, sorry, we, we've seen multiple kind of attacks on DeFi in, in particular over the last couple of months. And I think people in, within DeFi are starting to realize what some of the limitations might be. 
and those limitations can be attributed i mean they can be you know kind of more at the middleware level or at the kind of you know defi protocol level uh, some bugs within smart contracts itself it could be issues with uh, the underlying protocol in terms of you know scalability issues and so uh, i think in that sense having um very very specific chains that solve certain uh issues or you know if we talk about the scalability trilemma um you know not everyone uh, not every application needs very high throughput uh some applications may need greater security or uh some applications you know especially micro payments may actually need that throughput but may not need you know a very high level of security so how do you create this mishmash um of uh, kind of applications running on uh, potentially uh chains which are very very suited um to that particular use case while still having interoperability uh you know some of the other things that we've seen kind of you know different teams are now trying to bring bitcoin uh which obviously is you know still has more than i think 60% kind of dominance in as far as uh, the tradable tokens go uh some teams are trying to bring you know bitcoin into the ecosystem and and so having interoperability with uh, you know with something like that Uh, as far as you know purely if we exclusively look at you know asset exchange or defi uh from a use case perspective uh, you know kind of you know not looking at some of the other use cases that defi sorry with that ibc kind of powers uh but within these use cases i think uh, it definitely makes things very interesting and addresses some of the uh you know exploits that have uh taken place due to certain shortcomings that may be present uh on, on some of the other chains so it's kind of no no one blockchain fits all kind of uh perspective and and having extremely extremely kind of uh you know targeted uh, chains running certain kinds of use cases yeah uh yeah i agree i can add a little bit more as well about you know how i think ibc is like a game changer so so just a little bit of my intro so i am the cto of ban protocol we are building kind of like an oracle set specific blockchain right so other blockchain can kind of request data from us we go do some of our economic and then we submit data back to the decentralized blockchain right and before the ibc we we have our own like way of implementing kind of like a light uh modification on different blockchains right we do it on evm we do it on some other chains as well but we are building on cosmos dk so so you know after the the ibc alpha launch we got our code to to work with that uh, we'll be check a little bit and and then it works right and after this uh you know the the experience of of integrating with different blockchains like i mean it already exists right S- spv and stuff already exists but what ibc bring is like the standard of how the chain communicate right so as a developer you don't need to to roll out everything again right the setup already you know explain how you track the validate validator set what the trusting period is and and you know as a developer you can you can iterate a lot more quickly now because because the infrastructure is in place it's like ethereum right uh what ethereum is live you can iterate very quickly because you know deploying smart contract is a lot easier than uh, like forking a blockchain and then you know adding like c cache feature and what not right so so you know that that's what ibc will enable uh and and you know a, a lot of like cosmos based blockchain right like kava terra they all need to connect right and you know what ibc is li- is live that 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 be very simple and i think that will you know enables a lot of activity cross chain yeah i guess some uh, great points are uh, there by everybody and i guess uh, it was the first question i was uh, expecting it to come a later uh, stage that d force being hacked uh, i just last night about uh 25 million dollars so that is something i guess ibc will bring on and we would be talking about security going forward in the next panel from the developer perspective as well um so just to take the conversation forward we have as so far we have just talked about bitcoin being exchanged ethereum being exchanged so a lot of conversation about um asset transfer cross change asset exchanges but what are the few other major use cases that the panel feels could be implemented once ibc comes out i think the first thing that springs to mind uh, was part of my answer and 
it's obviously economic, economical cases, economics, uh, because the amount of the use cases that I can think of was pretty much endless. As long as one chain has to trade the utility with another chain and they agree on the rules of that exchange of communication, then that creates a use case. And I mean, if, for example, foam, which do triangulations, uh, you know, I mean, this is one use case, for example, right? And then you have another use case for like that you guys already mentioned for DeFi and whatever, right? Which is just very simple use cases. But again, as long as a chain has a utility and it can communicate that utility, it's a use case. So this is like endless, endless amounts of use cases in my, in my view. Yep. Um, I think uh, one of the things that, um, you know, from, again, uh, you know, from, I guess, persistence's perspective. So one of the things that we're trying to do is trying to bring um, certain enterprise use cases uh, into, into the public blockchain domain. So historically, if we look at uh, where enterprise use cases have resided, they have primarily been on um, private blockchains like Hyperledger, Corda, um, or even private implementations of Ethereum. And, you know, a few reasons why that has been the case, you know, obviously one is um, privacy. Privacy is really, really important for enterprises. Uh, they, you know, they don't trust anyone. Uh, they want to keep their transactions private, the logic private. And so I think from that perspective, how we're thinking of, you know, interoperability is uh, at some level interoperability between, you know, private and public chains. So the mechanism that uh, we are thinking is having certain um, uh, zones with varying levels of uh, being private or public or varying levels of even being, uh, you know, permissioned or permissionless. Uh, in terms of, you know, who are the validators, you know, whether these are third party validators um, uh, distributed globally, or these are third party validators distributed domestically within a nation, especially for certain uh, government use cases, but still having certain elements of, um, you know, game theory in place, because one of the uh, biggest drawbacks of having completely private chains or having nodes that are being fully operated by uh, a particular organization or even a group of organizations is that, uh, you know, data can be manipulated. You can roll back the chain in certain cases. So how do you have, for example, a distributed third party validator set, but in the absence of a token, because it, it become, becomes very difficult to have a token, um, especially once you have enterprises, uh, you know, involved because they don't know how to customize these assets. They may not have appropriate risk management procedures in terms of, you know, implementing multi-sig. Um, so how do you implement mm, some levels of incentivization or disincentivization uh, for the validators that may be validating for a private chain or a consortium chain? You can actually implement that um, at, you know, at the hub level, for example. Uh, so you can have the zones which are a little bit more private, but the hub is, you know, permissionless and, and more public. Um, and you can connect these zones to the kind of the main chain uh, and actually implement, uh, you know, governance at that level. And so, you know, what we believe is, you know, outside of kind of the, you know, straightforward things that, you know, people, you know, instantly think about in terms of, you know, bringing like, Bitcoin into the ecosystem or bringing, you know, Ethereum into, into the Cosmos ecosystem and having interoperability between all these different chains. I think what one of the things that IBC enables is also interoperability between, uh, you know, some of the private uh, and um, public chains. And, and this is how we believe, um, you know, more interesting applications come into the system. Uh, there is greater monetary inflow into the ecosystem. And, and this is how we kind of go about, you know, realizing uh, the, the full potential of, you know, what the industry stands for and, and what it brings to the table. So I just wanted to hop in real quick and talk about this privacy question and, and, and sort of encourage a little bit more sophisticated, um, like a, a more sophisticated way of thinking about this or, or um, discourse around it. So I, I think the biggest component that we should probably sort of talk about in um in the in is about um what is less about privacy and more about 
data availability. So for, a, for, a vari for some enterprise use cases, data availability among, beyond to like sort of to a wide range or to the entire network is really not a value add. Um, you know, there is data that you want to, that needs to be available to the rule enforcement agency within a consortium or a small community, but there's really no value add to making that data broadly available. Where we need both broadly available, broad data availability and privacy, we have powerful tools like, um, uh, we have powerful tools like, uh, you know, whether it's uh, zero knowledge proofs or, or secure enclaves. Um, these, these, are, these give us the ability to uh, compute on data where there is broad availability. What I think is one of the sort of really important innovations that IBC uh, uh, brings about is it brings about interoperability without requiring data availability. Um, and that is, I think, like one of the sort of most interesting sort of surface areas for innovation and most interesting surface areas for onboarding new players um, into um, the, the ecosystem. There, you know, first and foremost, there is no requirement that both sides of an IBC connection be a blockchain. Um, you know, we, we are supporting what we call solo machines um, in the initial versions of IBC. Uh, but a solo machine could be an Oracle database. It could be, um, it could be your company's uh, ERP system. Um, it could be any number of things um, that are other than a blockchain. Um, but a consortium blockchain is just as valid. Um, and the flexibility that IBC brings on this data availability front, um, I think is probably like potentially one of the sort of strongest assets of the protocol. Um, and you know, I'm hoping that the message around this kind of um, is able to percolate out into the parts of the ecosystem um, uh, where, you know, uh, uh, where, where this makes a difference and we sort of get some innovative use cases and innovation around this. I'd say the other piece that I think a lot about is, so, you know, in, in, the, in the sort of broader innovation of co innovations going on Cosmos, it's sort of interesting to innovate. We have this opportunity to innovate on sort of both layers of the system, both looking at use cases where, you know, not having data availability is an advantage. And then we have projects like Lazy Ledger, which are all about scaling data availability enormously in ways that were technologically infeasible, you know, a few years ago, so that you can have applications that essentially can rely on a single, on, a, on another blockchain or on the hub uh, for data availability and that you don't have to spit up a validator set that is gonna credibly provide data availability for every application. So anyways, uh, I think potentially talking more about this flexibility of the data availability model for IBC um, is, a, is a potentially far more, uh, a new, is a better way of capturing the nuance and showing how IBC can solve problems across the entire spectrum of, of sort of asset management, you know, of, of, of blockchain use cases, not just, uh, um, you know, sort of a narrowly uh, positioned solution. Yep. Um, I, I just got a message uh, from Abhitaid saying uh, that he wants to cover some of the privacy stuff uh, in, in the second panel. And that's how he had kind of planned. Cool. Uh, uh, the, the natural the transition. Part. <laughs> Absolutely, but I think I think it it makes uh, complete sense, and um, you know even from our perspective, I know you know uh, you know some of the work that uh, the lazy ledger folks have been doing, and um, you know Deepan Shu from the team has been in in close touch with them as well, and so I think that will definitely be an interesting uh, point of conversation. Um, Abhitesh, do you want to um, yeah take over um, in terms of inputs? Um, yeah, absolutely. other folks. So just, yeah, just uh, sort of it, you have been working on the DeFi side a lot and uh, there's been a lot of 
like presence around that IBC is going to break new uh, horizons for DeFi industry. So uh, if you want to just add on something, what you guys are doing and how Im implementation of IBC will change uh, things for you. Yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, I, I think DeFi is def definitely interesting, right? On, on Ethereum is, is booming right now a lot. I mean, we know that, right? But, but I think it will grow beyond Ethereum. And, and what IBC actually allows is that it allows like different blockchain. I, I think Saki already touched this a little bit, but it are, allows different blockchain to, to, to use different security model, right? On Ethereum, if you, if you deploy on Ethereum, you kind of choose to use that model, right? 15 seconds block time, uh, 8 million gas limit, whatever, right? That may, may suit you, that may not, but you have no choice, right? If you want to stay there and, and stay in, in the operable, right? But, but on the Cosmos philosophy, uh, on the other hand, right, like different blockchains can, 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 can have different security model. If you want it to be secure, uh, I mean, you cannot go against that, that trilemma, right? I mean, I mean as te technology progresses, then it will get faster, but eventually you, you got to make your trade-off, right? Uh, but, but this will allow DeFi to, to, grow, to grow better, I think, right? Because, you know, then, then you have a chain for, for DEX, right? Like, like Binance chain, you, you want something more quickly, you have a store value that should be more secure, right? But they all can communicate like, like through one interface, right? And I think that, 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 that that's very interesting for, for IBC. And I think that, 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 that can like, you know, help with the DeFi ecosystem a lot. Uh, if, 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 if the trend is moving this way, uh, I, I'm not sure, but, but we'll see. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Thank you guys for answering this question. And um, to all the participants, at the end of this panel, we'll have a quick um, round for question answers. So please, if you guys, I know it's been um, the few terms that have been tossed up. It's good to take notes so that when you are asking questions, that, that makes sense and there's a proper flow um, and they are relevant to the panel discussion. Uh, just moving on to the next question, you guys have mentioned, uh, as Sarawit mentioned and Zaki earlier, that Binance, uh, Binance moving their entire DEX chain to uh, you know, Cosmos was a, what is a decision that was made on the scalability security um, reasons. And that's what the next question is all about. That blockchain has been around for 10 years, right? And the, the most people always have been pushing a scalability. And what do you think IBC will, how it will help to boost that scalability in terms of operation, like block time or, communication with other chains, your thoughts. Um, I was going to give someone else a chance. Um, I think for, from our perspective, I think a couple of things. One is just horizontal scaling. Again, I think, uh, uh, and I'm sure, uh, you know, Zaki will have some thoughts on it as well. Um, and, and some of the other folks as well. But uh, you know, f and, and going back to kind of the, you know, quote unquote, Black Thursday, if you have kind of, uh, you know, high value transactions taking place on a particular chain and suddenly the chain is jammed up, um, uh, you know, you can't, uh, it, it creates issues and, and that's not something uh, that is ideal from uh, the end user perspective. So uh, I think uh, one of the things is uh, definitely horizontal scaling across um, across, uh, you know, chains, across zone chains. Uh, the second is, I think from one of the things that, uh, I think a lot of the conversation has been around uh, fungible tokens and, and asset exchanges, um, uh, you know, pure exclusively from a, you know, fungible token perspective. Um, one of the things that is interesting from our perspective is usage of uh, non-fungible tokens. And, and having interoperability uh, for, uh, for non-fungible uh, you know, tokens across uh, you know, different kind of uh, different chains. And those could be kind of different zone chains while you kind of the you know, asset exchange happens uh, at, the, at the kind of main chain level. So again, I think one of the things, and this is something uh, that Ethereum has not been able to do in terms of uh, kind of the storage of metadata um, in, you know, within, within the cosmos, within cosmos and within kind of the, 
uh, you know, hub zone ecosystem or hub zone uh, mechanism that has been created, one of the things that it facilitates is uh, you know, the storage of um, uh, NFTs on chain with kind of the exchange of these NFTs happening um, at kind of the main chain level. So, uh, you know, one thing uh, that is, I think, you know, super, super interesting from, from our perspective. I, I don't know if, uh, you know, Sauravit, if you have, you know, certain thoughts or, or Sergey as well, if you have yeah. certain thoughts about it. Yeah, I think, I think scalability, scalability is, a, is a tricky word, right? Uh, and, and I guess, I guess I'll come back to, to my answer to the previous question again. I, I, think, I think blockchain is quite limited because, you know, it tries to to get all the purpose, right? Try to be a general purpose like machine, right? And and I think scalability can be can be improved uh, with like purpose specific blockchain, right? Like if you have a blockchain just 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 fully for the purpose of like storing data, right? You can have data on that blockchain, you know, have their machine fine tune to to do good on data storage, right? And nothing else, right? And and that will be the scalability by by the meaning of that blockchain, right? Uh, and you can have it on the blockchain for for GPU computation, right? And 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 one blockchain can send a packet to to this blockchain saying that I want you to compute something for me and send me the result, right? And that that will improve the scalability, scalability of the overall ecosystem a lot, right? Uh, because because each blockchain is doing what they are doing best, and they're just you know communicating to right? And, and I think I think I think I think I think that 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 yeah, that, that can improve scalability a lot, you know, just beyond the sharding, right? If, if you, you, you use sharding, they all share the same model. Uh, even though the overall scalability goes up, it, it won't be as good as, you know, being specific. Uh, so I think that's my take on the scalability, yeah. Um, I would actually say scalability is a tricky one, in my opinion, because it depends on what bottleneck is, obviously. But, mm, like, I would talk about like obviously from again from our perspective being like a knowledge kind of protocol um i think the easiest the, what what, I, what it brings is communication and i think this is the easiest way as well of thinking in terms of ibc after all like all of us are here and regardless and I'm, I'm talking about blockchain in general is because we want to communicate in a censorship free and in a trustless environment and this is a place where we all communicate we achieve that style of communication. And I think the easiest way to think of IPC, if we put the technical things aside, is a communication tool, which allows, instead of, let's say, having the number number, right, like 150 people that you can communicate to, it allows you to scale that number and speak to more people. And when we think about communication, obviously communication isn't just exchange of words, it's exchange of value, exchange of knowledge, exchange of uh, whatever, right? So, and, and uh, so again, in my perspective, IBC just uh, is a tool to ease communication in a trustless and censorship free environment. So, this is the way I, I would kind of sum it up. I think Vlad has a question. Uh, it's not about question, it's more about analogy. If we want to create ecosystem, we need to make blockchain more near to real ecosystem. And I already was speaking with Sergey about this. It's like analog with forest. Forest is a huge blockchain and exists different trees. Different trees, it's a different chains, uh, different blockchains, but they all together in the forest. They have a, something like a trend transactions like their cones, their seeds, they put it. Also exist uh, mushrooms which are underground, which are help to the different three kinds of trees to connect with each other. So we can look for analogy in the forest, how forest work, how work real ecosystem, that exists some animals, animals make some shit, Bacteria eat some shit and produce minerals. These minerals take it by the trees. Trees create them to give the food to the animals. So um, uh, uh, IBC it's a something like a forest, and uh, we need uh, to try um, like the best analogy is already exist. We just trying to create ecosystem, and we are part of this ecosystem. Um, every tree is a node. 
and every of this node have their DNA. It's a, like a blockchain, but the same DNA like all other trees. And uh, different trees have different DNAs, but they are compared to, the, to each other with the, some bacteria, animals, or mushrooms. So we need to take some, it's a, something like analogy, something like an idea how to compare it. Uh, uh, but idea, of course, is great. Uh, and I think that uh, in the end, we will be have a huge, huge blockchain made of huge, huge blocks, like a distributed web where every node is a distributed web. That's all. <laughs> Zaki, you want to add something? Um, all I'll say is, yeah. Um, well, I would just say that, like, my basic point of view is that until IBC exists, blockchains um, are kind of like the... the, the well, so we started this conversation out about scalability. And... Um, I probably, I started working on public blockchain scalability in 2015. Um, and what I think the biggest realization for me has been that scalability is all, is not about a one size fits all scalability answer. Um, that in general, scalability is going to be primarily about what is it that you want to scale um, and um, and and how do those uh, 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 do, do those things uh, uh, compose? So is IBC the one size fits all answer to scalability for all uh, use cases? I don't think so. I don't expect it to be. I don't expect there to be ever a, a single solution um, from a scalability point of view. I do think that the um, uh, it, you know, if IBC proliferates in the way that I'm hoping out into the blockchain ecosystem, that many kinds of scalability um, are going to be uh, eased, um, or that there and that that abstractions that allow people to uh, develop uh, uh, more sophisticated ways of working around scalability or, or like building like in systems that scale gracefully or degrade gracefully under load um, will appear. Um, and that, that's sort of the, the biggest thing. Like one of the IBC protocols that I think will be most interesting to see, um, especially for DeFi applications, is sort of this notion of, um, of, of distributed locks, of, of being able to essentially say, um, you know, this piece of state or this smart contract or this will not change state until this asynchronous transaction resolves across some number of blockchains. Um, and I think getting that form of concurrency control right is going to be like one of the most interesting places to start innovating around because you can have uh, things like flash loans over IBC, but you have to be explicit over what state is being locked um, during the execution of a flash one. Um, and it'll be, I think, probably pretty fascinating to see these sort of locking protocols emerge over IBC um, over the next couple of years. Sounds amazing. So to, I guess, to sum up what we have come across and made notes of everybody speaking. Um, so it's like, there have been limitations in other protocols and majorly about like, as uh, Sorovet mentioned, that there is not uh, enough uh, capability to customize your chain on other platforms and that, that give, limits your use cases you're dealing. And But with Cosmos, um, Tushar, Zaki, both of them mentioned about bring your own blockchain and that gives a lot of independence in creating use cases. Um, with in fact, of IBC, I guess the most important part which will come in place is collaborative efforts to take the ecosystem forward. And I guess Waldemir also mentioned about that forest ecosystem. It's about different chain have different functions in the whole ecosystem. And then they will 
since till now every chain has to do their own function and they are trying to create all solution for everything and zaki at the else uh, at the last mentioned about it that we cannot look at scalability from the, there's no set rule for scalability i guess it's different for every chain but with ibc being uh, in place every different chain will can do a very specific um, function and then all can collaborate together to take any use case forward uh, or have a broader goal um, and then i guess uh, pretty much covered most of the things we wanted to cover in this uh, panel we have a couple of like we have some good questions coming in and i guess first one we can open up for is abhishek uh, from freeflex media um, and they've been doing a great job on cosmos ecosystem and they've created a uh, cosmic compass as well so yeah over to you abhishek hitesh if you can unmute abhishek for the question done yes yes am i audible like yeah yeah so uh, zaki mentioned earlier that ibc will enable communication with non blockchain systems like erp oracles and so on so forth so uh, in that you know having that said uh, is there a possibility for ibc to enable you know just non blockchain systems communicating with each other and uh, if that's the case uh, we can look at ibc as uh, powering something like uh, zapier or an ifp so um my answer to this question and i'm, I'm i my uh, uh so my answer to this question is is that um ibc um in its primordial form has been powering non blockchain systems um for uh maybe 20 years um that the you know what what if you kind of look at the career trajectories of the agoric folks um they came up with these ideas around e rights and composability across enterprise uh, across you know uh financial systems um you know the their vision of bringing this to the public internet in the 90s um did not come to pass um but then they um have deployed systems for you know financial backends at microsoft at uh at uh, google all inspired by you know this work and what ibc so you know ibc's conceptual framework and like essentially basic ingredients have been uh existing in intranets now for about 20 years and now what this is basically what we're doing is we're building the first internet for for um for e rights and composable uh, uh uh smart contract systems and um what will hopefully happen then is when you have an you know the, in the same way that um you know application protocols existed before the internet over sort of corporate network systems but the explosion of innovation once you had the ability to use the same protocol against across both your intranet and your internet um i'm hoping the same thing will happen with ibc where um the use cases of ibc in you know erp zapier all of the stuff will 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 rapidly proliferate because they can be used in the same the same set of abstractions can be used both for intranets and internets thank you so much so much saki for answering it uh i guess that that's been a narrative for a lot of projects that been talking that as um, tushar keeps mentioning uh, as well and that as there will be shift from public uh, from private to public chains it will eventually happen and i guess ibc is going to accelerate this process as same way um uh, things move from intranet to internet um taking up next question i guess sai has a question now uh, hitesh if you can unmute him hello is it audible yes yes please sai go ahead so as uh, most of the people are told me that uh, about ibc scalability so which is for a uh, inter inter blockchain communication right so what is the scalability issue in uh, within the chain so presently we have validators like uh, 125 right yes on the cosmos side yes i 
think Hitesh is back on mute. Hmm. And it's gone. I just unmuted him again. Yes, I. You can speak. So why would scalability issue? Currently, we have the one twenty eight five one twenty five bullet test file. So it will uh, around six minutes, six seconds to commit. Suppose if we increase the validator slash one second. So is there any plan for to change the scalability issue inside? So this question is about this. So again, this is this is the question. When people say scalability, they mean different things. Um, what is it that you, uh, uh, what, and like the whole point is everybody wants scaling different things. Um, so there is the, the, the question was like, can you build a tendermint that is more scalable than, uh, the current, than the current system? Um, and so the question is, is, um, consensus scalability. Um, are there, um, applications in which, a multitude of validators can um, can sort of collaborate together um, to uh, 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 so should the Cosmos Hub have more validators? I don't know the answer to this question. Uh, it's up to Cosmos Hub governance. It's a complicated question. Um, is 125 some sort of technological upper limit? No. Um, no. Is six second block some sort of technological upper limit, even with the current software? No. Um, uh, we are simply, until we have uh, the, these parameters were picked because um, uh, block pruning um, didn't exist yet. Um, and in this massive upgrade that I was talking about, we get block pruning. Um, so we're really setting the uh, basic components needed for a more high throughput Cosmos hub. Um, Taking classical BFT protocols and scaling them to thousands of validators um, is an area that there's been a lot of research and development around using things like aggregatable signatures, et cetera. Um, but right now the economics don't really support that. Um, we need uh, protocols that are much more valuable um, and are able to sustain larger security budgets to meaningfully uh, get value out of larger numbers of validators. Um, and so how we, how we bootstrap our way to that world is, is still an sort of open question. So yes, um, I, don't I, I, I think that there's a tendency to excessively focus on um, technical areas around technical limitations on scalability and to sort of be like, my technology has better technological parameters around this scalability metric than your technology does. Ultimately, none of this matters. Um, what matter? What is largely the rate limiting function on most forms of scaling right now is uh, of of scaling of of sort of block times and consensus and stuff like that. Is what are the economic requirements and um, what makes sense? Yeah. Um, thank you, Zaki, for answering that. I guess we will get into depth of the tech side and how the development at the background is working um, in the next panel, which will start in a couple of minutes, where we'll have the Panchu Asmadat um, and Dogen Moss from Tendermint. So to quickly, you know, talk about to all the participants is that we focus about so there's game of zones coming up, which will open up new possibilities first at the uh, validator level or the ecosystem level. All the players will get together and try to um, create or work through different challenges, which is we're gonna talk next. That is where a lot of these questions will make a lot of sense. Um, and all the developers out there in um, the call, please make notes and please ask questions for after that um, panel discussion. Here we are gonna talk about, the, it was a great panel discussion. Thank you so much, Sergey. Thank you so much, um, Sorabeth, Tushar, and Zaki for this panel. And what, what is an interesting point that has come out is that a lot of people need to realize that IBC is not just about Cosmos. It's way bigger than that. And that's been always the vision of Cosmos ecosystem. It's being about bringing in every, everything together. What we have been doing for so far, we're taking a, a step forward otherwise. Um, and to size question again, and what Zaki also mentioned, we are in a very initial stage um, of blockchain. 
being adopted. There are different technological limits we are trying to deal with. And over the next uh, couple of years or next five years, we don't know the right answer. Things will sort out and then we will see the acceleration altogether. So um, thank you so much guys for joining in this panel and um, we will quickly jump to the next panel. All the questions if you guys have, you can send me on a private chat as well. So just to all the participants, if you have any questions, please send me through private chat so I can see and I can direct them to the respected speaker. Um, so to jump on to the next panel, we have uh, Josh from Tendermint team. Uh, popularly known as Doggy Moss. He has been also leading most of the efforts with uh, Cosmos South Korea and has created such a beautiful community in South Korea. Uh, at the same time, we have the Panshu, who is the CTO of Persistence, as well as co-founder of Cosmos India, um, who has been actively working on the IBC side. And we have Asmadat, who is the co-founder and CTO of uh, Kira Core and have created Interchain uh, Exchange. So welcome guys, along with Zaki, of course. Um, I, is everyone on mute, just to check? Yep, hello. Okay. Asked that, I guess, is yet to be on. Yeah, we have everyone on mute. So welcome guys. Uh, now is where we get onto the tech side of things. Um, so just to you know quickly start, I guess Zaki gave an introduction about game of zones. But if you guys also add some points of what like how games of zone is and how does it work, it will be very um, helpful for all the participants to understand what is the core idea behind game of zones. You want me to just start? Because I feel yeah, like yeah. Zach probably more well, better suited um, to answer this question. Um, Zaki, do you want to start more in an elaborated way what we're trying to do with Game of Zones and how does incentivized test networks? Yeah, so I think, you know, one of these, one of the things that we've been trying, you know, it's been, the question has always been, you know, it's always this hard chicken and the egg problem. Right now, we don't really know what the applications of IBC will be, but we also know that these applications will not uh, come into existence if no one knows how to uh, route IBC packets, um, manage IBC under difficult network situations, no one understands the security model, um, nothing will come into existence and, you know, this whole thing will, will, um, will, um, and so what was very successful, what was pretty successful, what was so successful about game of stakes is that, you know, so we had this sort of year long process of teaching people how to be validators, um, in 2018 and we sort of culminated it in game, in game of stakes. And that sort of created this population of people who now knew how to do this thing, um, run a validator, and that bootstrapped this whole proof of stake space uh, enormously. Um, we need to do the same thing with Game of Zones. We need to bootstrap um, the IBC space. Um, and we don't know all that will, it's hard to anticipate all the things that will, will sort of come about once IBC uh, exists. But what we will see um, sort of first and foremost is, um, is, the, is, is, is what, we, what Game of Zones will do if it's successful is create this universe of people who have a fairly deep understanding of the software, of the protocol. Uh, and so that as, in, as developers bring innovations on top of IBC to market, um, we can sort of see uh, uh, rapid adoption, scaling, et cetera, and an evolution of tooling and, and processes around. It should also create like a, uh, it's sort of also, you know, I think creating an environment for everybody who's been using the Cosmos SDKs uh, to become familiar enough with IBC to immediately sort of adopt it. And something I'd like to add, I think it's like, I think it's really interesting, like coming like a year, over a year after Game of Stakes, like 
um, like a lot more proof of stake networks have launched. And uh, I think what's really cool is that these um, validators that did participate in game of stake um, do have an edge overall compared to kind of like newer entries. And these, you know, these validators are going into other proof of stake networks and bringing in their expertise. And, and then I do think that like game of stakes had that major role in kind of bring up like bring up the quality of the validators of the cosmos ecosystem massively and that's uh, i think what i expect to happen in game of zones with ibc as well great the puncher you wanted to go uh, uh, yes uh, so like i've been interacting to a lot of uh, blockchain developers and uh, majority of the projects that like are that i interact to are live or the developers that i talk to have have done their work in ethereum using smart contracts and when i try to explain them the paradigm of cosmos and how to start developing on it or show the sdk they all have this one uh, like they get mind boggled by this complexity of hosting validators defining your own parameters governance parameters and uh, like basically figuring all the base level layer uh, uh, like blockchain stuff out that they did not have to do in ethereum and uh, they, they would generally ask me this question is, is there any chain where i could uh, like directly deploy or is it a, is there a validator set where i can directly deploy and for that scenario, it's, it's, I have to explain them. You can do that. You have to actually like run your own validators and uh, run your own chain and define and take the pain off all the all that stuff. So for people like those, I guess uh, uh, something like the game of zones will be a very nice place to figure out, even if they're not implementing their custom chains, to see how to actually go about doing that, how to like define their own a validator set, uh, see how they would interact and what would be the possibilities of interacting with other chains or how their code that they might have built on a solidity contract on Ethereum uh, will fit into something like Cosmos and the like stuff, the standards defined on Cosmos and the, the tokens, etc. cetera. So, so yeah. just like, I wanna quickly hop, hop in there. Um, one was one real, concept that I want to drive sort of in the after IBC launch world is the fact that you don't need a validator set to launch a Cosmos song, especially in the sort of IBC world. Um, so I think two things will likely come into existence. One is IBC is perfectly happy to live in a world of short lived blockchain. Uh, blockchains that like come into existence, demo or a new application, that application, um, you know, transacts small amounts of value, uh, interacts with a small number of assets and protocols over the IBC network, and then gets shut down. Um, and so you get this, you have this opportunity to kind of rapidly prototype on top of IBC and um, only really go to like a more scalable validator network. I think the other thing that you will probably see over IBC is um, validator as a service IBC protocols, um, where blockchains will be able, like the Cosmos Sun, will be able to make their validator set available to new applications um, who are willing to sort of pay the Cosmos Hub validators um, for securing their application. And this will ideally provide a sort of um, much more predictable and less intense process of launching Cosmos zones. Um, than the sort of current post pre IBC world where yes, um, you know, it was like you, you, know, you have to create a validator set, you have to do all these incredibly difficult things. And it's kind of amazing to me how many teams have succeeded in it, um, but we're gonna bring the, you know, IBC provides a, a set of tools for bringing down the, the um, activation energy needed substantially. Uh, like, uh, for, for that point, Zaki, like what, what, what I would want to discuss here, uh, will be the point that uh, uh, let's say that uh, uh, there are a bunch of chains that exist out there and like any state that is present on one chain is uh, available for as long as that chain exists but once you connect it through IBC like that data is persisted throughout the existence of the whole network that is the IBC network and let's say there is a small validator group 
like one validator and if it were to collude now that like in incorrect information or in consistent logic is now persisted throughout the history of this network or let's say if the uh, like the group of validators or the small chain were to exist and go away from the system then how do you how do you like disincentivize or slash these people on on such a system so for like the, that's the basic question that also people ask me the shared security model like on ethereum uh, you run a incon inconsistent incorrect uh, contract now you have the ethereum validator set to uh, secure that but what happens if every new application is their own chain and how does ibc solve that particular problem of transient uh, and small uh, chains So the basic idea here is tolerating failure rather than trying to prevent it. So the idea of shared security is, is that we can't tolerate consensus failure. So we will build these incredibly complicated mechanisms about random beacons and sort of random sort and sortition of validator committees and do all and like build data availability systems and, you know, layer these technologies on top of each other so that failure is impossible. The reality, the, 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 the base, the IBC model is very much a model of stuff will happen. Um, consensus failures will occur. Validator sets will be untrustworthy. Um, and, you know, some people will lose funds as a result of this. But the trade-off is that, you know, Innovation will occur much more quickly. Um, and now you can also sort of start inserting um, slashing models, um, validator set projection, um, enhanced security um, mechanisms in selective ways where these things matter. And, you know, if there is a blockchain and that blockchain never handles more than a few hundred dollars worth of funds, uh, because someone wants to try out an application, there's really no sensible reason why that blockchain ever needed to pay for a large amount of security. You know, basically the shared security model is, you know, every application, no matter how important or how, uh, uh, is paying for the security of, I need to handle, you know, billions of dollars of assets potentially. Whereas, what we're trying to do with the IBC model is start aligning value under under management with with like the need for for security, and so this this is our sort of core vision here. Um, and I'm well, I'm I think you know on one hand everybody would like to make sure that the Cosmos security model can support these high value applications. We also think that it's really important that not every application pays for um, uh, you know, the security for like a maximal amount of security. And ultimately the IBC network will tolerate, um, you know, networks colluding, consensus failure, et cetera, by exposing, you know, connection failure, by allowing people to report um, validator uh, misbehavior and closed connections, et cetera. And then, the, you know, governance on chains like the hubs will have to figure out what to do about the assets, et cetera. Um, uh, but, you know, and, and this will be the evolving sort of social layer on top of Cosmos. And I think that's a really interesting point because, um, like, I think a lot of people see IBC as a, a way to scale and interoperate. But I think the other site that's really exciting moving forward is it's like it's a giant experiment in blockchain sovereignty, which was not, um, which was never like, you know, done before just because there were never um, interconnected sovereign blockchains. And I, I think that's gonna be really interesting to see how that evolves. Um, like, will people choose big hubs and big blockchains um, for convenience uh, or maybe kind of uh, composability of things being really close by? Or, um, you know, how will they manage being a, uh, the sovereignty aspect of it and, and being connecting to a lot of the convenient big blockchains um, in the future. So that's that's something that I'm really looking forward to as well. Okay. As for that, uh, I guess 
that's some interesting point uh, related to security, uh, shared security. Hitesh, if you can unmute, ask me that. Yeah, you want to add something over it. Waldemar, yes, we have seen your uh, hand. We will, at the end of this panel discussion, we will have question rounds. Okay, so maybe about the IBC security, like the only thing I notice is that obviously you, know, you can define some kind of, um, some kind of, uh, not a concept, but the variable that defines, you know, like how secure your network is, right? So there are many factors that come into play. Right? Might be validator set, might be amount of assets at stake, might be some other kind of properties that you, you might not even comprehend, right? So when the value tra traverses through the interchain, through some through the multi hop, then you know every time the value travels from one network to another, this, uh, this certainty that the, the security of your asset is becomes the security of the weakest link in your chain through which your asset traverses. So the only thing that we noticed, like, and so, you know, as a security team we are trying to figure out and solve is how do we actually make sure that if we can we this that the path where the assets travel is as short as possible that's one thing and you know like i think that at least that's in my opinion you know like the thoughts i have about ibc and security that you know like when you deploy your new chain you know how are you going to optimize you have to think about how are you optimizing your path is it worth to connect to cosmos hub or maybe it's worth to connect directly into into the peg zone or wherever other place where assets are coming from and regarding the um what was mentioned at the beginning that there might be a problem with bootstrapping new networks we also we also recognize the problem there. We think that uh, we think that uh, we think that uh, the approach that persistence is doing in terms of uh, in terms of securing uh, new blockchain applications is interesting, and that is permission validator set. I'm quite skeptic about permissionless validator sets and that's probably why Binance also went with the model of permission validator set I think so you cannot join a network just because you stole someone tokens and this might be even more prominent if you have IBC on top of this entire on this entire uh, layer right so if some zone goes malicious, those tokens can be used, right, to become a validator on a hub or some other blockchain, right? So we need not only a way to create zones securely, we also need a way to make sure that even if something goes wrong and the IBC and assets get stolen, that those assets cannot be used to compromise the network of the hub or wherever the assets originate from. So I think that, you know, at least in our opinion, the, the, the future probably is somewhere in between the, the like truly decentralized world and like uh, fully, you know, uncentralized world where you have still, you know, sort of validators that you can elect, but the validators that is permission so that governance can say that, oh yeah, okay, you know, like you can be a validator, but you have to meet certain criteria, right? And I think that it will be very prominent in after IBC goes live, that this kind of um, approach to security might be, you know, most simple and I think most promising to new projects. Um, 
I guess that's amazing point. The amazing points brought by the Pancho that how do we secure if a new project comes with minimum validators? And uh, I guess the other side of the same story is what Zaki mentioned. It's a uh, it's a huge experiment, and that gives liberty to all the people come in, and also allows us to see where we are vulnerable. What is the weakest link? Um, and Game of Zones will provide a lot of insight into that experimentation, and also allow the zones already running uh, on Cosmos ecosystem to see um, how they can make sen- themselves more secure. Um, and on the points as Asmadat and the Panchu mentioned, how to um, deal with the problems of replicating the entire data onto the entire network. Uh, how the, would that happen? So the vulnerabilities are removed. Um, and uh, also to all the participants, I guess that's a great um, news and you should go out, you don't need to be a Cosmos developer to participate in Game of Zones. I keep on repeating again and again, I guess. Zaki also mentioned, you have a smart contract to see how you could um, use that thing into the entire IBC module, an entire Cosmos ecosystem, experiment with what zone um, do you have compatibility with? And, uh, and also the interesting point and a lot of questions I get, and that is what I'll re- just direct to Dogimos uh, after this, is that what if I'm not able to run my chain throughout? If I'm not able to get validators, if I'm not get able to get a lot of value. Zaki mentioned it's, it's just the right time for those short-lived uh, blockchains to experiment. And uh, Dogimas, as a core tenement um, team member, how do you get questions from developers? Because a lot of people want to get insight and what you would tell them about Game of Zones, how you guys are planning to accommodate all these indie developers into Game of Zones? Um, I think something to point out is that like, um, well, we are like one component of reaching out to developers, like uh, the ecosystem and, and, and uh, developer support um, comes from all sides. So I think uh, it's been a lot more dispersed and you know, and, and the Discord channel has been just a really good place to start where um, people in the community, people from um, inclusion and also Interchain um, have been mostly helping out in terms of the IBC. And if, in terms of starting out like um, with Game of Zones, I think the biggest thing would be if you think you don't really know what, like where to start, I think grabbing someone and making an alliance uh, was is the way to go. I, I do think that Game of Zones is a little bit of a bigger scale project because you are essentially running a zone. And um, I think Game of Zones has a really compelling uh, uh, kind of idea in having an alliance even more so than Game of Stakes did. So um, all you need to do though to win the first phase to like get through the first phase of Game of Zones is to take the Gaia software, set up a blockchain, and do a little bit of scripting and monitoring around the relayer so that it keeps the connection alive, and you'll succeed. Mm-hmm. But what about the, what, what do you see on the next stage? Of that? Well, the next stage is gonna be really about your ability to uh, get transactions through on your own channel and mess with other people's channels. Um, and then the uh, third phase is all about clever, underhanded stuff that you can do um, in, in the, in, you know, uh, and like, you know, how c- can you break, can you uh, uh, take this idea of the, co- the, 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 the kinds of Byzantine behavior that IBC is designed to tolerate and use those Byzantine behaviors to uh, to get an advantage on the other players. Right. Um, Amazing. So, um, Zaki, like, uh, so I would have want to ask, like, uh, how would uh, like custom implementations on the like of chains on Gaia would fare, and will there be like any special considerations for, let's say? Uh, someone using IBC for transporting messages other than Sendcoin, like maybe governance or NFT transfer, yep. some scenario like that. Um, so in the, we are we would are really, ex- so um, there are two things. One is 
if you have a custom implementation and you want to use that custom implementation in phase one and phase two, you should make sure that your custom implementation passes the test suite in the occlusion relayer repo. Um, if you have a custom implementation that doesn't pass that test suite, but you think is interesting and does interesting stuff and um, have plans to interact with other blockchains and the IBC network that do in the in game of zones that do interesting things. We're definitely going to be looking at, you know, custom application protocols and um, that, so, you know, the, the two things that we're looking for in the third phase is interesting custom application protocols and interesting ways of flexing the Cosmos security model, um, the IBC and the IBC security model. Um, and so, you know, the, all of that is very, very custom friendly application. So I, what I'm suggesting is people do one of two things. Either if you want to take your custom implementation and use it throughout the entire game of zones, um, then do so using, um, then do so using the, um, uh, using our, our, our sort of custom, um, uh, then do so using our custom, uh, sorry. Do so using the, make sure you pass the test, test framework. Um, if you want to use it only in phase three, then just use a Gaia fork for phase one and phase two, and then bring your custom chain to phase three. Great. Uh, I guess then we've covered these important parts, how to jump in Game of Zones, what's happening. According to uh, this panel, and we would go with the Pancho, Asmadat, and Dogimos, and at the last, Zaki can conclude with what's happening on the GOZ team side, um, saying, what are the biggest challenges in upcoming Game of Zones, and how projects are preparing themselves for these challenges? The Zaki question, because he's the one that's uh, operating all the no, missions. Yeah, I'm saying we can start with uh, the punch to on the project side, like oh, oh, how projects are preparing oh, oh, oh. Um, sure. for these challenges um, on the, like what are the biggest challenges for each project for Game of Zones and how they're preparing themselves to participate. Because I've, I personally have heard amazing stories about Game of Sticks. And I wish I was there. I was like, uh, I interacting with so many people in the Cosmos ecosystem. I've been like, oh, where was I in Game of Sticks? It's like everybody was stick onto it and bringing other networks down. It's like the craziest thing somebody wants to do, bring others down in a battle. Um, so, yeah, like, the punch. Yeah, so like definitely the team has got some experience from the game of stakes and we do remember uh, sleepless some a couple of sleepless nights and all the like constant communication between other participants about what's happening about information traveling about updates etc and like definitely the one thing that uh, really helped us that we realized a little late was building scripts and like building those uh, devops uh, like infrastructure around the nodes and like right now we have uh, pretty much all of those very sorted, including uh, the scripting, etc., and the communication. So definitely much more prepared this time. And yeah, uh, like we did participate last time as, as, as in the Monica Condex. And it would be really, and we, we did one win one category as, as far as I can remember. And really excited to see how like, things will play out in this one. Definitely persistence going big guns out <laughs> this time. Ask me that you want to talk about how Kira is preparing. For so how are we preparing? Like we are trying to get up the relayer working and to connect. Like so, so like the biggest challenge in our case is scrapping all the code into some Docker on Sybil container, or maybe um, using for making some Debian package so that's easy to redeploy because I believe you know the biggest challenge will be that you know this the software updates will be after it starts launching will be like once uh, once every few hours so you know and then yet you have to continue keep you need to keep the connection and transfer coming all the time 24 7 I I believe like from the spec I read like well, at least once every hour so you know like we're trying to you know wrap everything and if we manage then 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 we will submit the application so at, at least on our side that's what's going on okay 
talking about mm-hmm. wanna give the Everett protocol mindset. Are yeah. you guys participating? Yeah, yeah. The Everett team is uh, getting ready for it. Uh, obviously, we have Kepler. Uh, we, we're we're trying to see if we can get the wallet working for Game of Zones uh, for IBC. Awesome. It's, kind of, it's it's a lot of work uh, in the midst of everything, but we're hoping to be able to do that. So, like, just the average user can receive like a specific token of the Game of Zones, um, like a zone. Uh, that's one thing. And then the second thing, um, we're gonna try to test out some of the early like proof of concept uh, interchain accounts um, on gaming zones, hopefully see how that goes. Uh, we do have an early implementation, we just need to do uh, some tests uh, and checks, but hopefully it would work and we can get uh, interchain accounts working on the game of zones testnet. That's amazing. Zaki, just a teacher evaluator there. Are these guys gonna make the challenges? Um. I mean, well, like I said, I, I think it's I think it's going to be interesting to see what the balance is in phase three between um, between sort of creative building projects and creative and like underhanded like it's going to be like oh I have a very cool um, zone that I want to show off um, during phase three versus like I have a very cool zone that does something super underhanded um, as well. Um, and uh, so we're gonna see, um, but uh, yeah, I'm very excited. And uh, you know, we're kicking off a new round of um, of of, uh, of of test nets, kind of merging everything um, in on the in sort of like we should have essentially like a IBC Game of Zones release candidate um, on on of the relayer and and master or like you know, hopefully tomorrow. Um, but we'll, we'll, we're sort of aiming for that, um, and, and that's pretty exciting. Um, we have this IBC hackathon that's also going on, um, and hopefully all of you guys are are participating in that as well, the Gitcoin hackathon. Um, but yeah, I'm very excited to show off all the cool things people are building with IBC, and very excited to like you know kind of get start um, uh, showing that uh, getting a sense of who you know that the network is ready to operate the system. Um, that's very exciting. Just, uh, just one question to you, um, to you know, going off some of this question. There, is there one challenge? Did you think um, this is going to be the mind blowing challenge? Uh, considering that there was never jail category and so many categories in Game of Stakes, one uh, challenge that you were drafting or trying to build, you thought you know this is going to be the biggest thing this Game of Zones. Well, to- so I guess that one like sort of like. We have a, I have a couple of things that are just sort of hypotheses. One is, you know, um, in phase one, is there going to be a line um, of users in which the, um, in the, uh, uh, you know, how many users are just going to keep their, be able to, you know, are, are most connections going to have inter- uh, liveness interruptions or are we going to have, are, are most connections going to sort of survive the entire game? Um, uh, or the entire phase. Um, that that I think is going to be like sort of very comparable to the never jailed category, um, which is basically I was able to keep you know I was able to instrument the relayer software um, in such a way that you know very confidently was able to keep a connection alive. You know, the the big difference is you know so the reason we have this twenty one day unbonding period on the Cosmos Hub is keeping connections alive is supposed to be a very leisurely activity on mainnet. You know. As long as a connection, as long as a packet gets exchanged every 21 days, the network stays up, or the connection stays up. Um, um, the um, the second piece is um, is the um, is the um, the, 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 so that that'll be the, the that'll probably be the equivalent to like sort of the never jailed category. Um, then you're going to have this sort of throughput ranking category, and and this is you know going to be about you know how cleverly you can interact with this with the system as a whole. It's going to be like uh, cleverness with the with the sort of integrated IBC system. And then the third phase is all about like protocol level um, innovation and protocol level you know, underhanded interactions with the protocol. 
And, you know, this is kind of trying to get something as exciting as what we happen with, you know, uh, forking out the, the bitfish, uh, uh, stake.fish Sybil attack um, uh, in, in, IV, in, in Game of Zones. Um, and so hopefully some exciting stuff will happen there. Um, and yeah, um, it's going to be pretty, it's going to be pretty cool. Great. Uh, I guess then the last question of this panel we would jump onto is if given a chance, you had to, you had all the resources um, and all the, like all the idea, what would be the first use case you would like to work on IBC? Like everyone uh, giving their opinion and then what? I'll go last. Okay. This is the time for ideas, um, so that a lot of people get these ideas. Um, some developers out sitting there sending these text messages, how do I start with IBC, what I can do on IBC. I guess this question is for everyone, um, those people. Uh, ask me that, you want to go first? What would be that one use case you would like to work? So, you know, like the, regarding the one use case, like, Obviously, it's not the use case that we will be working on on the on the day one, but what I would want to see is something I proposed, I think, like very long, long time ago, the idea of the warp jumps. And uh, warp jumps are uh, temporary IPC connections, fast temporary connections that you can make directly to any zone and ecosystem. So it's not like everyone is connected you know at, at all times more like if there is a need for a connection connection can be opened and fun, fun, funds are being transferred and if it's not needed it's just the connection is taking down and like how i envisioned that idea was to create some kind of registry that let's say on the hub or the most secure chain that would contain all the information that other chains could use to uh, create those temporary connections. So instead of, you know, like trying to figure out, you know, like how do I communicate with chain A or chain B, there would be like one place where all this data is stored. So if I want to figure out, oh, what's the set of validators on some other chain, I would just go to this main chain. And then if, uh, you know, something changed for me, I would just, for my, my zone, my hub, whatever, I would just, go to this registry and modify it and then I request modification or maybe that would be also you know I don't know done through IBC so at least that was my 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 idea about those this 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 warp jump so let's say um, if I need you know bitcoins from a bitcoin zone I could directly communicate with the bitcoin peg zone and then close this connection and you know so that the path where the tokens travel is as short as possible at all times so that's at least from, you know, like how abstract this idea is, you know, like how, how useful is it this at this point? I, I don't know, like from like what Zaki told me in the past is that, you know, like it can, could be potentially done on top of the IBC. It doesn't have to be part of protocol. Like IBC is supposedly capable of creating this kind of, uh, um, using this kind of registry. So at least that was, was our idea. Great. Depancho, you uh, defining yeah. one you see. Yeah, sure. Uh, so like, uh, like uh, we've been communicating with a bunch of projects. Of course, like you can't clap with one hand. You need other projects also to like uh, work on some custom implementation. So like the one that uh, that people are really interested about is uh, NFT transfers. Uh, currently, IBC. Uh, it allows for fungible token transfers, but we would want to see like how ownership of and redemption back burn and uh, like mint of NFT token, custom NFT tokens can happen across these chains. Uh, the second will be uh, certain governance governance messages being passed through. So for example, there being a sub hub uh, that uh, does implement certain kind of permission uh, participation in, uh, in the network, IBC network, and it does like ask for a certain stake for you to participate in the network. So how do you like slash a certain chain, not not the validator as it, but the chain itself for like uh, going down and misbehaving, etc. So these are the things that have been gaining like a lot of interest 
and on top uh, like uh, POC kind of things would be like maker taker IBC messages. So like, let's say one chain wants a certain token of one kind, they just post a method saying this is the rate and these are the tokens I want and that, that will be the maker message. And uh, any any other zone that do want or do want to sell or take those uh, like tokens can just post a message, corresponding message and like exchange. So like kind of an IBC marketplace. So yeah, those will be the ones that are on top. Wait, Josh. Yeah. Um, I mean, other than the inner chain accounts that we're hoping to work on, um, share security is pretty cool. Um, that brings new incentive mechanism in terms of the economics. Uh, another kind of like out there idea, I, I think June mentioned this um, when back when he was in Korea, but he was talking about decentralized game lobbies. So like if you wanted to play StarCraft, uh, there would just be a hub, which is the lobby. And then um, when you want to 1v1 someone, it will just create a separate uh, zone for your game. And then it'll just be a direct connection from player to player. Um, if considering that this is a like a decentralized game that lives on the blockchain, but you also reap all the benefits of uh, of like fully permissionless censorship resistance, where at but your game game itself could be really fast. So um, yeah, that was something that June mentioned. So I'm not going to take credit for it, but I thought that was pretty cool. <laughs> that that's an interesting idea, Zaki you want to add um so what i'm sort of most excited about is um is sort of the pivot from um what is the value like sort of um of once we launch ibc is sort of pivoting to where what makes the atom token special um what, where should the Atom token interact with the IBC protocol that adds the most value? Um, and so I think some of these ideas that have come up about like um, shared security, collateralization, all of these things, governance, all of these things are, are right at that. But um, I think one of the things that's most special about what we've built is, you know, the, uh, you know, in the Cosmos SDK, Atom token isn't inherently special. Any Anyone can build a blockchain with the Cosmos SDK. In IBC, the hub and the Atom token aren't uh, inherently special. Every blockchain can connect directly to every other blockchain. So we get to move now um, sort of further down this question of what, what makes, what are the comparative advantages that different zones um, will provide? How do we actually have an economy where comparative advantage emerges and what is the comparative advantage of the Adam token? That's pretty much like bringing together the ecosystem with one uh, token, I guess. Right now there could be so many tokens running around. Uh, creating one um, Umbrella token, I guess. That would be really interesting and also grow the entire ecosystem value. Um, so I guess all the participants now know all the ideas these guys have mentioned. If you have any thought process related to those, you know whom to reach out. Uh, and I guess everybody is very open. You could join Discord channel, you could join Telegram channel and reach out to correct stakeholders if you have anything related to these ideas. Um, I guess we will open up for questions now. Um, and Waldemar has been waiting for some time now. Hey guys, hey Valdemar, please yeah. uh, come up. So this is the one of the most uh, important questions of scalability, it's a usability. For example, web 2.0, totally unprivate, totally unsecure, and totally bad uh, in compare with the decentralized structures. But everybody use it, and also on my mobile phone, it's a uh, Android with Google Play, of course, I use decentralized application, but with centralized operation system. So, um, usability, question of usability, it's a question how I can use not Android and not um, Apple, I, not iOS, but some 
DOS, like DOS, but decentralized operation system that I can put it on my, my, my mobile phone and have something like a decentralized app play where I can download all decentralized application and uh, uh, get full usability, like sending messages, getting some information, peer to peer. So uh, this is very important question of the opera decentralized operation system that will be alternative to the Google, uh, to Android, to iOS. So it must be some something open source like Linux, maybe it's, uh, Linux had uh, some interesting projects, but it was not about decentralization, it was about some Ubuntu on the mobile phone, but we need to think about creating of decentralized operation system, and when I can download it for free, it will be uh, more usability, more usability, more scalability. So I, uh, my friends not ready to use uh, decentralized applications and also Cosmos because uh, for this you need a computer or notebook, but most of the time I use uh, my smartphone. This is the first what I was uh, was telling. And the second, like a future value, it's uh, not a money, future value, it's a data. And uh, data, this is the what about blockchain. So maybe we need to think about something like a data exchange like exist economical part of it like a coin exchange and i have a decentralized and centralized exchange to uh, change the coins but it's not about changing the data and the uh, internet of blockchains it's a changing of the data not of the coins maybe we can create something like data exchange um i don't uh, this is just uh, my new idea that i get uh, uh, when i was listening to you so I don't have uh, some cool uh, options for this. It's uh, just an idea. Absolutely. I guess I'm not sure about DOS, decentralized operating system, but I, I'm sure like we, we are getting to a phase where data is collected in a decentralized way. And I guess sort of it, um, if you want to jump in and give an idea about this, Hidesh, if you unmute about how data is being decentralized, being collected. I'm sorry, can you? I you? Uh, Valdemar was mentioning about like if all the data that's been connected, uh, collected is on a mobile phone and it's a mobile phone he or any user is using is being monitored by some centralized authority like Apple or Google Play. So he's like, how do we create a decentralized operating system? At the same time, I was mentioning that the data needs to be decentralized and from a decentralized source, it is to be collected. I guess you guys are working on that, at least on the data part. So if you guys wanna add like how that revolution is coming, we are into that wave. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm honestly, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not so sure about the decentralized like operating system part, right? But but I guess I can talk a little bit about how like what band approach is for for data. Right? Uh, I mean we are working on data Oracle, so basically the idea is just how to uh how to bring data off chain right uh, onto the blockchain in, in the way that I mean different Oracle protocols have different trade offs right uh like you know some opt for like proof work style some more like you know, autonomous, like very quickly, kind of like automation, right? And that, that's what we are aiming for. So basically, you know, we are, we are trying to make sure that, you know, people that bring data to blockchain, they have skin in the game and they got slash if they do something grumpy. Uh, so so I guess that's, 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 that's our take on, you know, trying to bring the data from 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 off chain to on chain, right? It's not it's not about privacy though. It's it's primarily we just just you know how to make sure the data can be trusted. Uh, so yeah, that's that's how we do it on band protocol. Uh, yeah. Anyone else wants to add on the decentralized operating system? Uh, uh, I mean. I guess like if it's talking about usability, like I do think this is a major task that the Cosmos ecosystem needs to figure out is 
like people have trouble just using a single blockchain type like application, um, like accounts, wallets, um, explorers. And, and now we're moving into a world where we're going to have multiple. Uh, and I think this should bring about like a fundamental change in terms of like user experience and interface in how explorers look like um, or how wallets look like or yeah and, and just even just those two things um, you know because most of the action will not be isolated to a single chain most actions will be going across different blockchains um, and you have to manage you know the nodes on all of that receive data from all of that and then kind of refine that into very usable information um, where it's easy to understand and, and and i think that's going to be a big challenge um it's it's something that no one has ever done uh, but i'm kind of looking forward to what type of ideas and uh, breakthroughs come about in 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 the multi-chain user experience uh aspect great Zaki, do you have anything to punch you if you ask for that? Any one of you having anything to add about? So maybe um, regard the, the dApps on client side, like I was under impression that the light demon client, right, is what makes those kinds of decentralized application happen on, you know, on any, on any operating system. No, it doesn't matter who is the author of the operating system. You know, it can be something that you you trust. You know, it can be Ubuntu, maybe this Kali Linux, right? So maybe something else that's open source and you trust, right? And you, where you run your application, you know, I think the point here is that when you have the uh, the centralized application for the end user, you know, the end user should not care that there is some token, should not care that there is a that he has some wallet, he should not care, you know, that there is some explorer or blocks, like the end user will have no knowledge about it, right? So all the user should know about is that, you know, he has application, he clicked, you know, pay in Google Pay or Apple Pay on some other gateway, and that he has access to whatever feature he wants, whether it's storage, decentralized VPN, whatever the hell that is, right? So. I'm under impression that LCD is already what solves this uh, issue. You know, it allows your mobile phone to connect directly to the blockchain application without a need for any middleman between you and the blockchain, like you have in case of, let's say, Ether Delta or Ethereum, right? There has to be always someone that translates you, you know, what's happening on chain, right? Some, some, some server, some backend, and uh, shows you, you know, like aggregates the blockchain state and shows you in the UI, like, okay, you know, this is what the blockchain says, right? So, you know, like with LCD, I imagine yeah, like you can directly from within your mobile phone talk to the blockchain application. And then it is up to the designers of those client side applications, right? To abstract all the IBC, all the uh, all the tokenomics and wallet management and so on, so that the client should not care at all about any of that, right? All the client should know is that once once he, once he clicked the button, you know, there are some tokens, credit, but he doesn't have to know though, that those credits are really EUSD coming from eMoney.com zone and that now they are going to be used to pay for some the VPN you know, somewhere out there, right? And, you know, like, I think that's, that's the main goal regarding the, the centralized application and regarding you people owning their own data. Yeah, like, I think also that this is a big challenge uh, for centralized, the centralized application to compete with centralized ones is that most of the most popular applications, they have a business model, not that user is uh, getting some utility, so he's paying for that utility, but because those uh, services like, I don't know, Google, YouTube, etc., they collect data about you, right? And then they sell your data, and because they sell your data and they make money on that, they can provide you the service that they use for free. So they are using you as a tool you know, they, they steal data from your information about you and they share this with others, right? So they offer you a service for free. 
you know, like, so the decentralized applications are a disadvantage to such business model, in my opinion, because, you know, like, how are we even going to compete, you know, if the uh, centralized world offers you service for free because they can sell your data later on. And, you know, I think, you know, like for people that are self-conscious about, you know, how secure they want to be, do they want to really be influenced by what they see, et cetera, right? You know, or not, you know, like, I think there's a lot of customers out there for that, you know, but how do we make people aware that, you know, they, you know, like if something is free, you know, it, it's not necessarily really is free, right? Because, you know, this data that's being collected is used for, let's say, some other purpose to attract your attention somewhere else and make money on you. So, you know, maybe that's, you know, the direction we should go. I guess on that point, uh, Dipanshu, do you want to mention about, like, because what I guess exactly persistence is doing abstraction of token at the application layer. Uh, Hitesh, if you can unmute the punch. Uh, Hitesh, if you can unmute the punch, please. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's, that's a very, very good point Asmada brought up like, uh, uh, just to just to like quickly extend on that and then like uh, present uh, my own ideology so uh, earlier on internet like it, in generally it generally it was very difficult to pay for stuff so the devious methods were built to make people pay for like the services that they were uh, like utilizing on internet that was not directly money because paying for through for like small amounts of like let's say one google search with money would be a very difficult task right so you see ads and ads accrue value, someone pays someone and like finally what you consume is paid for. But with the current digital currency, like it, we are now a lot allowed to pay for services like even one Google, Google search through a very small transaction that we can send. Uh, it, it, even at this point, it's, it's a little difficult, like the time taken to send across money, it's like the tokens is, is, is still a little little on the higher side. And on top, like different services require different token. And at this point, you would require, uh, if you wanted to like consume a service A, which uses token A and you have token B, you'll have to go to a centralized exchange, exchange it for A, then come back and send it, right? But like uh, with, with the technologies like IBC coming through, uh, it would be really possible for you to pay for a lot of your services without actually having to go, in, go through a centralized exchange. Like one, so it's definitely a step, uh, step towards that future where like you can like uh, pay for any services in any currency in, a, in any small value and it would be like so easy for you to do so. Uh, coming to the point of uh, certificate management, uh, like your uh, key management. So uh, generally, and like a uh, majority of the users that we see, uh, it would be a life we said they are general users uh, for uh, any any kind of decentralized application. Majority of the users and users of any D apps are enthusiasts and enthusiasts know about technology and know how to manage keys, etc. And uh, to assume that a general user would know about that key is it would be a little too ambitious. Now we know that the, the people utilize digital certificates and utilize those to sign documents, but they do it through like in, in the current world right now. And they declare their certificates online also to, to verify identity. But the signing process, they generally do not do themselves. Like they, they, they give away uh, that certificate to a proxy that does the signing on their part. And that is what I propose. And that is what my ideology is towards uh, this particular scenario. Just like how you would tokenize a card, like your credit card for car card not present payments. Uh, you send in all the details of the cards and they are tokenized and kept safely while you retain one small, uh, one small, uh, let's say, secret of that card that only you know and the proxy do not know. So in your, in your card, card's case is the CVV number. Like, are, are in majority of the cases, you do not like, uh, in, in majority of the card payment schemes, you do not even have to like give the secret. The charge happens automatically. So that is what, since this is something that is already present and prevalent, where 
your secrets are managed by a proxy. Like I think uh, certificates could be uh, certain and keys could be something that could be managed by uh, proxies, which where you just attain a small part of the secret that will be required to like send in a transaction. So that is uh, that is the ideology we use while building applications for persistence, so that the end user do not have to handle uh, the, the secrets. And uh, yes, that's that's the, that's our way of thinking about these problems. I guess with Zaki's or like opinion and view, uh, then we will conclude this panel. Um, to just jump in the brief resources people can refer for Game of Zones and what's happening around. Zaki, do you want to add? Um, so goz.cosmosnetwork.dev is the Game of Zones sort of entry point website. Um, the best thing you can do to get ready for Game of Zones is, um, is start playing with the Relayer repo um, and um, you know, uh, get involved in the Relayer test nets that are spinning up this week. Um, also, uh, there's the Gitcoin um, cross-chain hackathon going on right now. Another great place to get involved with IBC. So, yeah, not sure if you guys have seen it yet, but I did some presentation on, on the Gitcoin presentation uh, last Friday. So, did some small sample demo as well of how you can transfer token. And, yeah. And, and we actually published, like, the whole process of, like, from scratch, like, cloning repo and, and run everything. Uh, with Cosmos, actually, I think it will go out tomorrow, probably. So yeah, so I think that would be a helpful guy as well. Um, yeah, guys, uh, about this panel, thank you so much, guys, for joining in. Um, Zaki, Asmodat, um, Dogimos, Tepancho, and sorry, thank you for jumping in for the question as well. Um, guys, there's just to conclude whatever has happened. I guess the last question was if great insight and uh, thank you Waldemar for that question that talked about usability and approach we are heading towards in terms of what is needed as a blockchain ecosystem. And still we are in a pretty nascent stage to be at that say where nobody needs to know. Every general user is using um, blockchain as background, but it's happening. That is all we need to know at this point of the time that those things are in motion and maybe in two years, three years or five years, we will have a decentralized operating system, decentralized applications all around um, new ideas coming in, of course, and IBC is the foot in the door for that world. And um, about all the resources related to Game of Zones, we would be distributing out from our official handles. You can always reach out to me regarding any doubts you have to where to approach, I guess uh, goz.cosmosnetwork.dev, as Zaki mentioned, is a great uh, directory with all the resources related to documentation, related to relay, related to registration form and everything. And to mention the cash prize for Game of Zones is very important for everybody to be motivated. It's um, 100,000 atoms in today's market value. It's around 250,000 USD. And um, there are so many categories you can be part of. As Zaki mentioned, there is at stage one, stage two, stage three, you could be part of stage one, gain experience, win it. Uh, and of course you win a share of the price. Um, and the Gitcoin hackathon is in parallel going on. We will put out a thread only dedicated to uh, Gitcoin hackathon that's named cross chains. Uh, and all the resources related to Hackathon you can find on Cosmos India Twitter handle as well as on a Telegram handle. And we will try to get again in touch with um, stakeholders in the Hackathons to come up with another interactive session or a webinar where uh, we can tell you about what's, what's more happening. Um, thank you guys, everyone for joining in. Uh, any questions that has been um, left out, please feel free to reach out. Um, to anyone in Cosmos and their team, or you could join uh, Cosmos Network, Discord, Telegram, and you can ask your questions there. Uh, it's a Cosmos project on Telegram. On Discord, um, you can find the Discord link on cosmos.network and all other channels, um, links as well there. 
And thank you so much, uh, guys, for joining in. And it's a Sunday night, I know. Uh, I hope we were able to give you some insight about what's happening with IBC and what's the way forward, um, interesting ideas. And just an announcement, a uh, quick announcement, and this was a surprise element. We're going out with an ambassador program from Cosmos India that's open to everyone, developer, professionals, already uh, people who are project owners. Um, we will be rolling out the applications on 26th of April, uh, April, soon after the GOZ application closes on 25th. So feel free to fill out the application. Um, we will be including these people in the process uh, of all the events we organize, all um, the community engagement as well. And uh, we have three more initiatives coming up before May 3rd. So stay tuned and stay home and stay safe. I hope uh, the crisis ends well soon. So thank you so much, guys. Bye-bye. Thank you, Zaki. Thank you, Dipanshu, Solovet, Tushar, um, Asmadat, and um, Dogemos for joining in, and everybody. I guess there are pretty, a lot of names I cannot mention. Thank you, guys. Good night. Bye-bye.